So um, I'm going to spend the next uh, 15 minutes, half hour, trying to uh, make a sales pitch to you about why this is a class that's worth attending. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the class is titled in the, in the uh, university uh, schedule as operations research, but we're going to be doing stochastic programming, which is uh, solving optimization problems under uncertainty. So um, these problems are quite general, uh, but there are specific computational features that we will be focusing on during the course. So typically we live in an environment where we are looking deep down in the time and we are making uh, repeated decisions in discrete moments in time, trying to optimize some expected cost objective. But after we make decisions, we get to observe uncertainty. We react to uncertainty. Uh, then we get to observe more uncertainty, we react to it, and this goes uh, deep down the line. Anything we do in life can, could be expressed like that, so the class of problems is enormous, but uh, we're going to be looking at specific uh, formulations, in particular linear programs, possibly with integer decisions. Um, so we're going to limit the scope to, to specific problems, but still they're general enough to hopefully be useful for you uh, later in what you do. So, um, the, uh, the, one of the first things you want to ask yourself is, does it even matter to solve problems this way? Uh, we can write a really complicated optimization problem about, for example, trading a stock under uh, uncertain fluctuations and how we should do it and what our strategy should be. And we can write this enormous stochastic program with uh, 100,000 time stages and one trillion scenarios. But in the end of the day, maybe a simple trading rule like sell above 60 euro and buy below 50 might be really close to optimal. And all this fancy optimization we did is more or less uh, an academic exercise with no consequence. So. That's one of the concerns we will have. When is a problem worth bothering uh, by taking an approach of stochastic programming? And the other uh, concern um, is, can we even solve this thing? So uh, there's always this trade-off of making a model very, very detailed, but making it so large that you can't even load it on your computer. Now, the, um, uh, here's a list of applications. So as far as these two questions are concerned, the good news is the following. Um, there are problems for which writing them as optimization under uncertainty problems, it makes a huge difference, very different decisions and very different payoffs and much better management of risk. And the, the certain classes of problems like these can also be solved very fast, which makes them also very attractive for industrial <coughs> applications. And that gives you a really, I mean, if, if you're thinking of following a career that applies uh, operations research in industrial problems, it's a really nice advantage to have a toolbox of algorithms that can tackle optimization problems uh, under uncertainty. And here's an example of a few industries that use these models. Um, so we have uh, revenue management, which is basically um, what airlines do to squeeze every drop out of their customers. Uh, so how do we allocate seats in an airplane? I don't know if you've ever been on these international flights. They can move the seats around to increase your leg space. It's not like they put the seat down and drill it at that spot of the plane. They can move it around. So they can change the size of business class, economy, and first class. And the, the way they make their decision about how much of the airplane to allocate in first class versus business versus economy is dependent on how many people will show up in the last minute desperate for a ticket. And uh, they need to get this really important business meeting in Tokyo. And that's when the airline is really going to hit them with a high price. But they have to buy the ticket because 
um, they can't do anything else versus how many people will show up very, very early on to buy an economy ticket. So the decision of how to allocate the space in the airplane between these three classes it can be <coughs> formulated as, a, as an optimization problem under uncertainty. Um, doesn't work great for the um, customers because ideally we would all like seats with a first class legroom and a very cheap ticket, but for the airlines, it's a good tool. Uh, so financial planning, ah, and there are examples of this uh, exercise in um, uh, chapter one, paragraph one of the book. Um, so financial planning, how does a trader take positions in a stock market where the trader gets to, has a portfolio uh, of uh, stocks and has to allocate a budget uh, that the, the trader is managing the stocks are fluctuating, there are correlations among the stocks, there is specific volatility associated with each stock. So how do, what, how, how do I allocate my portfolio to this uh, mix? Which stocks do I want to bet on and how do I want to hedge my position over a certain horizon of time? Um, then for energy, which is my uh, passion, there are plenty of examples and we will see one of them if we have time today on capacity expansion planning. But there's also very encouraging uh, examples of applications of very beautiful algorithms based on the L-shaped method, which we will see around the third, fourth week in this class. And these algorithms are running in control rooms uh, for scheduling the level of uh, hydro dams every month and setting prices in the market. And these days, there's even more uh, relevance because of um, wind integration in power systems. So there are very aggressive policies for bringing renewables in the network, but renewables fluctuate up and down in a very unpredictable way. So the question is, in the day ahead, how much backup uh, do we want to commit in the network? And there are very simple ways that of doing this which can be very dumb because you might be too conservative or too aggressive or you can formulate it as an optimization problem under uncertainty. Uh, then there is vehicle routing and Warren Powell who's a professor at Princeton University has made a living out of this. Extremely detailed models for deciding how to send trucks, uh, how to allocate trucks and trucking companies in between different tasks. Very detailed models, very uh, uh, detailed representation of uncertainty and very difficult to solve because these are typically, typically integer programs. Um, and then a, 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 a lot of other examples uh, from different domains. Uh, so the first chapter of the book has more detailed uh, discussion about each of these models. The only one that we will see together hopefully today is the uh, capacity expansion planning model which is an example of a stochastic program in action. Uh, like I said, um, energy, <coughs> which is the domain I'm more familiar with, has many uh, in, uh, applications. So this, go this slide goes back to the question I said earlier. Okay, does it even make a difference to bother formulating a stochastic program or should we just follow simple uh, rules of thumb and operators in control rooms know very good rules because that's all they do they spend their whole life Looking at the network and coming up with really smart rules to deal with uncertainty in the network in case something goes wrong But then uh, you can walk in with advanced optimization algorithms and show them something you know what if you Committed this unit in this part of the network. You could have actually avoided the risk of losing um, uh, having a blackout in that part of the network. And these things are adopted. It's not just academics um, coming up with complicated theories. There are algorithms that run in control rooms today in energy systems to support decision making in the control room. So the, the way a control room in, uh, works in power systems is much like the way a control room works in uh, an airport where the operator is deciding which airplanes take off, what time they take off, what's the sequence of, um, of operations in the, in the airport so that planes don't crash with each other and that the uh, runways are always occupied. In the same way, there's an operator in an electric system control room that decides which generators start, when they shut down, and these decisions could use a lot of OR methods for being done optimally. Um, okay, and 
beyond the applications, there is a lot of interesting theory. And it relates to duality. We're going to see uh, cutting plane techniques, Lagrange relaxation, and if we have time proximal point algorithms. So even if you forget about the applications of uh, stochastic programming, you still get a toolbox of um, methods that you can use for solving optimization problems in general. They don't have to be stochastic programs. Uh, stochastic programs. For example, Lagrange relaxation is very useful for stochastic programs because you can chop up a problem into smaller sub-problems, but you can take that same technique and apply it in a deterministic group vehicle routing problem, for example, where instead of decomposing by scenarios, you're decomposing by different uh, nodes in your routing network. So the techniques um, are there to be used beyond stochastic programs. Um, and then the one last sales pitch I have for the class is that um, there's this timing issue that makes um, the theory you learn here especially relevant for the next few years. Um, we are increasingly heading towards distributed computing systems. So, um, so if you notice your laptops are equipped with more and more cores these years, the reason being that you can't shrink processors down below a certain point, and in order to keep up with increasing computation speed, you just throw in more processors in the same machine. So as people working in OR, you can exploit that by um, developing optimization methods that take advantage of multi-core processing. And algorithms that are used for stochastic programming perfectly fit into multi-core pr uh, processing because the way we solve optimization problems in stochastic programs is we take an enormous problem of uh, solving for expected value and look at each scenario independently. And then we uh, solve that scenario. Uh, but the, the crucial thing is we can solve all of uh, the different scenarios at the same time and send back information to a master who makes some updating decision based on the theory we will learn, spread back the computation to all the, of the processors. So, you know, the, the fact that stochastic programming relies by the structure of the problems on decomposition techniques is a happy coincidence with the fact that multi, uh, with, with the fact that parallel computing is becoming the paradigm for computation in the future. So. These are a few reasons that I think uh, it's worth uh, considering taking the class. And with that, let's go. OK, this, uh, because Matthew is going to deal with a specific problem for the ample training section in uh, an hour and a half from now that's focused on um, facility location, I will jump to deck three which has an example of a facility location problem. And if we have time, I'll jump back to uh, the second slide deck over here on capacity expansion. If not, if we, I don't have time to cover it today, we'll cover it next week. <coughs> uh, OK. So this um, is now chapter two of the Burge Louvreau book, which um, talks about how one formulates uh, stochastic programs and what their structure looks like. So very soft introduction to uh, probability uh, spaces. Hopefully this is stuff you've seen before. And formally, when you're defining an optimization problem under uncertainty, you have to explain what the uncertainty looks like. And um, you have this very strict definition of a probability space, which is uh, a triplet. We have a set of outcomes, uh, capital omega. We have a sigma algebra on this set, which is a complicated way of saying that uh, the subset of all outcomes. And we have a probability function. So an example of this in rolling dice is the set of outcomes is the number you get to observe when you roll the dice. Uh, the, subset, uh, the set of subsets of outcomes is um, you take those six outcomes and you create subsets. So for example, 
uh, once uh, one member of this said script A is the collection of outcomes where we got to roll something that was less than or equal to a, a four. And um, this set of things that could happen uh, describes uh, the, the set script A over here. And then what this probability function does is it maps, it, it gives each of the members in this set a number which is the likelihood of that outcome occurring. Um, and then when we define this mathematical structure, ah, and the, this mapping here has to satisfy three axioms of probability, so uh, we assign a weight of zero to the empty set, we assign a weight of one to the uh, set of anything that could happen, and if we have two outcomes that are disjoint, um, then the probability of the one or the other occurring is the probability of one occurring plus the probability of the other occurring. And you can build a really rich theory uh, around just this uh, construction here. But for our purposes, um, what we want to do is use this uh, probability space to define a random variable on it. <coughs> a random variable, what it does is it takes uh, members in this set here and assigns a number to them. So um, once we define a random variable, we can uh, start talking about probabilities of the value that that random variable could take. And that leads us to the definition of, uh, for discrete random variables, a probability distribution, which gives a number to each uh, discrete outcome, psi k, of that random variable. And that probability distribution, little f, has to sum up to 1. And we also get the density function for continuous random variables, <coughs> uh, which is this uh, function over here. So an example of uh, where we would use a, discrete, a probability distribution is for the roll of the dice. It's a discrete random variable, and where the psi is the number that we get to observe. Uh, and for when we're measuring temperature in some experiment, we define a density function because the set of values that psi can take is uh, continuous. Then usual definitions of expectation, <coughs> variance. I want to highlight your attention here on the notation used in the book for the rth moment. So this is psi superscript uh, r, which is the expectation of psi to the r. And the alpha quantile <coughs> of psi is just the inverse mapping of the cumulative distribution function uh, on alpha. So this is just basically the probability of uh, psi being less than or equal to alpha. That's what we call the alpha quantile. OK, now, and that's all the probability theory we will need for the course. And we have the other element of the course, which is uh, optimization. And then we get to blend the two into what's called stochastic programming. Uh, and to discuss optimization, I just start with uh, following the book on uh, formulation of a deterministic linear program. No uncertainty here. We're making a decision x. Uh, the x vector uh, has n components. And we have a uh, linear cost function where c is the uh, coefficient vector of the decision x. A set of linear constraints which are m in number. So the matrix A has m lines representing the m constraints, and then <coughs> columns representing the n decisions, and B is a vector that lives in Rm. Uh, so this is a standard form representation of a linear program. Any linear program can be represented in this form by introducing slack variables and um, and you know, changing the sign of inequalities if you need to. Um, and we call it a certain vector feasible if it satisfies these two constraints. And we call a certain vector x star optimal if it's a feasible vector that is the cheapest possible for our objective function. Now, um, George Danzig, uh, who's one of the fathers of uh, linear programming, 
after blowing up linear programming into pieces with uh, the simplex method, which was also implemented in software beyond being a beautiful theory, posed the question, okay, we now know how to solve linear programs, very useful problems for many applications. By the way, he was funded by the US Army, which wanted to decide the, the, the reason linear programming was born was because the U.S. Army wanted to decide how to manage uh, ships in some operations, and these ships had to take materials to different army stations. So they hired a really smart guy called George Danzig. He formulated, he came up with the idea of linear programs for um, dealing with these decision problems. And then a few years later, he posed the question, okay, what if now some of the data in my linear program is uncertain. I mean, um, yeah, um, I might know that this warehouse will have this capacity, but it might turn out that actually uh, the capacity is a bit smaller or a bit larger, in which case this vector V, I'm going to give it a number based on what I think is going to happen, but maybe it's smaller or greater than what I think it is. So I want to somehow reformulate this problem to capture this possibility that things might turn out to be different from what I, I expect them to be. The moment you ask yourself that, the immediate next thing you ask yourself is, this is a meaningful question, only if I'm making decisions in multiple stages, because then I get to react to what I observe. Um, so that's how you set up um, multi-stage stochastic programs. So we're going to look for a big part of the course on, at stochastic linear programs, where um, we have linear constraints, a linear objective function, but some of the uh, C's, B's, or A's can be uncertain. Whether it's a C, a B, or an A can make a huge difference in how you solve the problem, but that's the idea, as we get to have uncertainty in the C, the B, and the A. Then, um, recourse programs are decision problems where we get to react to uncertainty by observing, the, observing it and then taking some action. And once we set up this uh, structure of timing in the decision problem, we can separate decisions between first stage decisions where we have to make uh, decision before we observe the uncertainty and second stage decisions where we get to uh, after we've made a first stage decision and after we see what happens we get to react um, so what we're um, the, the, the setup and the notation we will be using is I first get to make a decision X I get to observe a random variable psi of omega so the um, Dependence here on omega is indicating that psi is a random variable, it's something uncertain. And then the y uh, is something that depends on two things, right? How I react in the last stage is a function of what I decided to do in the first stage. For example, right now, I would maybe prefer to be in a bar uh, hanging out with the um, Friends, but uh, 30 years down the road, I will have been unemployed because I was in the bar and um, I won't have a pension, for example. So when I'm making life decisions, I'm looking down the road and my decision set in the second stage down the line is going to be much less rich if I haven't worked in the first part of my life. So um, my second stage decisions get to uh, be a function of what I decided to do in the first stage and what uh, I observed happened. Okay, um, and this is how you actually formulate the, the optimization problem. So, um, and here I want to direct your attention to just the dimensions of the vectors. Well, two things. One is the, direct, the dimensions of the vectors and the other is the uh, objective function here. So observe first, the structure of the objective function. You can see the timing embedded in the notation. So I react with a Y. I do the best I can uh, by minimizing the second stage. 
And then if I take the average of all these things that could happen in the second stage, that gives me this function expectation of the minimization of Q transpose Y. So Q transpose Y is a second stage linear program where Y is a decision variable, Q is the cost coefficient for second stage decisions. And then you have this structure that says, <clears throat> well, first stage decisions are X. What I decide to do in the first stage gets a cost of C. There are first stage constraints. Uh, and note, note that these are linear. And then you introduce this dependence of uh, what you can do in the second stage depends really on what you decided to do in the first stage. So uh, there, um, yeah. So if you want to think of it in mathematical terms, the right hand side, uh, once you made a decision x, the x becomes a parameter in the second stage decision and it comes to the right hand side here. So depending on the x you decide, the wy equals something uh, will change depending on this x. So you change the right hand side by changing your x. And you have the non-negativity constraints here. Now the dimensions are, we have n1 decisions in the first stage, uh, m1 linear constraints in the first stage, and for the second stage we have n2 decisions and M2 constraints. So M1 constraints here, M2 constraints here. Okay, and we uh, represent the randomness that could occur in uh, using this random vector Xi. So this is just taking all of the stuff that's random and just piling it up in a big vector. So what could be random in my problem? Um, the second stage cost coefficients. So depending on how the um, economy goes, things might be much worse or much better, so the Q might change. Um, you have the coefficient uh, matrix of X being random and the right-hand side of the um, second stage constraints being random and we, accum we accumulate all of that into a random vector Xi. Okay. Um, so one thing uh, that we're going to be using a lot in terms of uh, notation is uh, writing out the problem we saw earlier just as a function of first stage decisions, in which case it's not a stochastic program anymore because we lose this notion of scenarios. Once the second stage decisions disappear from here, it's just a problem in X again, which is why we refer to it as a deterministic equivalent problem. For the time being, this is just change of notation. It's nothing useful. But you will see in a few weeks that it's also very geometrical. So um, it's actually useful to computationally break up the problem like that. In that first stage, deterministic equivalent problem, and a second stage, optimization. So how do we do it? We introduce a second stage value function. This is a function of what I decided in the first stage and what uh, uncertainty I observed. And it's just uh, the best I can do given this realization xi and given my decision x. So it's this optimization problem here, which is a linear program, right? You have uh, linear cons equality constraints, and now here, the right-hand side is a parameter. Um, for the second stage optimization problem, the x is not a decision anymore. It's a number. It's a, it's a fixed number. So you tell me the x, I solve this problem. But if you tell me what the x is, this is just a number. So this is a uh, linear program, and this q of x psi omega is the second stage value function. And if we take the expectation, because this thing depends on uncertainty, by taking the expectation of that, we have the expected second stage value function. Now, if for some miraculous reason I knew what the v of x looks like, that would be great computationally. Um, when I'm solving the two-stage program, if I have one million possible realizations of omega, the inputting this in cplex and trying to solve it is impossible. Why? Because 
you get a big problem here, right? With one million possible realizations of uncertainty, you get an enormous set of, cons of linear constraints. But if some, someone came to you and tipped you off that, you know what, I'm going to tell you what the V of X is, great. You can just solve this problem, uh, which is a very small problem if the set of decisions, act, if the dimension of X is small. Well, you know, coming up with V of X, however, is unsurprisingly difficult. So, so but it, it's very useful to think of the V of X computation. Um, you'll see how it comes up later in, in algorithms. Okay, so um, here's the first example you will see of uh, a stochastic program. So we get to um, decide on uh, a bunch of facilities that we will open up. I'm going to follow. Um, yeah, we have a certain geographical region <clears throat> that's split into um, different areas. Um, and we're indexing each of these areas with an index i. And each of these areas has a certain demand. And we have a certain set of uh, candidate facilities to open in this area. <laughs> and we're going to index these uh, facilities with j. Now, the problem we want to solve is deciding which of these to open. If you open one, you pay a fixed cost, uh, CJ. If you, uh, OK, and then when you open a facility, you uh, have to transport the goods from the facility to the customer, and you pay a transportation cost for moving uh, goods from facility J to customer I. But you do get to, uh, you do receive a revenue from the customer, which we denote as RI. So the decision we want to solve is which of these facilities to open. And the decision we want to make is basically a 0, 1 binary uh, decision. And we denote it as XJ. So it's something that's indexed by J. Uh, we will assign a value of 1 to x if we decide to open that facility, a value of 0 if we do not open that facility, um, and we will assign, uh, we will also use this notation qij for denoting the revenue we collect from a customer when we're serving their demand. So what is the revenue I collect from a customer? Well, it's the price that we charge to him. I forgot to mention, we also get to pay an uh, operating cost for serving a facility, uh, for, for using up a facility J. And we also have a transportation cost. One thing to note, and in the next slides you'll see this changing, is that in the formulation I will show you here, the YIJ is a fraction of demand, uh, not a quantity of demand. So YIJ equals 0.3 means that 30% of that demand will be satisfied from facility J. So the total quantity of uh, uh, production from that facility will be YIJ times the DI, which is why we can write up the revenue in this way uh, here. Okay, so how do we describe this as an optimization problem without uncertainty? Um, we are um, maximizing profits, so we sub so uh, we subtract the investment cost of the first stage, and we add up all the revenues that we collect from um, serving each customer I from a facility J. Now, again, because the YIJ represents a fraction, this constraint here says that for each one of my customers, um, the fraction of, uh, if I sum up 
the fraction of services that this customer is receiving from different facilities, that number cannot exceed one. Um, and then I can only use up a certain facility if I've invested in it. If I've set an XJ of zero for that facility, I'm forced to set the YIJ to zero. I can't use that <coughs> facility's capacity because there's uh, no factory over there that can produce. Um, and you know, the trade-off in this optimization problem is if I didn't have to worry about uh, investment costs, I would just open up all of these things so that I could minimize the transportation costs uh, in each area. The problem, however, is that I am paying an investment cost. So I have to balance um, uh, how many of these facilities I open up. On the other hand, if I am too conservative and I open up too few of these facilities in order to avoid the investment cost, I then get hurt because I have to transport the goods to further locations, so I pay a higher transportation cost. So that's, a, that's the optimization problem that we're looking at. <coughs> okay, so now what the book does is it gives you different situations where um, the way uncertainty uh, occurs creates different first and second stage uh, structures. So here's a scenario of fixed distribution patterns and the revenues, operating costs, and transportation costs are stochastic. So this corresponds to someone, some manager, who is setting up a transportation company, and they need to decide not only on which of these uh, factories they will open, but they have to make an a priori decision about the routes also. It's all decided in the first stage. Uh, the revenues you collect from customers might be random down the line, and the operating costs of the factories might be random, um, as well as the transportation costs, but uh, you have to decide on the routes before in that case, um, basically, there is no distinction between first and second stage decisions. Both the X and the Y are first stage decisions. And it's a fairly easy problem to solve, in fact, because there's not much you need to decide about. You just have to make one call, which one of these to open, and how you set up the routes, the routes. It's a one-shot problem, and you do your best to optimize the expectation of the second stage cost, but it's a fairly simple problem because you don't adapt the routes depending on the uncertainty that occurred. So this is one uh, scenario. I will show you a second one, then we get to uh, take a break, and you will see uh, a couple of other ones, and then you get to program it or some simpler variation. Okay, here's a different situation. <clears throat> um, again, the manager needs to build these factories and say how he will decide on the routes. But now, um, it's not these things that are uncertain, it's the demand that is uncertain. That creates a, a modeling complication. Because now, if the demand is really large, there's the possibility that I might not be able to serve it. In this problem here, I know what the demand is. It's not an uncertain parameter. So I can always size up my facility to exactly serve up to that demand level. There's no uncertainty about, oh, you know, the demand turned out to be five times larger after all. But when I don't know what will happen with my demand, I might have to... Uh, the size of the facility I build might not be enough to, to satisfy that demand. So a couple of uh, pointers here about the, the notation. So first of all, now we, we are not uh, deciding on fractions of, uh, of uh, goods that we're transporting. We're deciding on quantities. So this is not 30% or 20% anymore. It's 50 boxes of, uh, you know, whatever uh, that product that that factory needs. So uh, 
we need to also introduce a couple of other things. So we have to somehow model the possibility that we cannot serve some of uh, the demand and we have to bring in emergency production from somewhere really costly and we use a notation Q plus to denote that. And we pay a lot for this. This hurts us a lot. Uh, so sorry, the, the decision is W plus and the penalty we pay is Q plus. But there's also the scenario if the demand turned out to be much less than what we expected, that we have to store the product as inventory. So we also pay a penalty for, for that. So the decision of storing inventory is W minus, the penalty is Q minus. And the model looks slightly different now. So the uh, CX is a, again a first stage decision, no indexing over omega here. And now the second stage cost components are the following. Um, here there's not really a decision to be made. I'm just collecting revenue based on the deal. I, I, I will serve the customer. I've promised that I will serve them. They will pay me uh, their demand. So there's no decision to be made uh, there. But I will pay different operating and transportation costs depending on how I decide on these YIJs. And I might also end up paying a penalty for bringing emergency supply from somewhere else, as well as a penalty for uh, storing inventory. And here I forgot a QI minus. Now, uh, the constraints look as follows. If I build a factory in a certain location, J, um, this big M here is a really large number that uh, makes sure that I um, that, that factory has space to uh, uh, produce the product. And then here's the way to model the inventory versus the, the backstop. So if the D is really high for that omega, I'm in trouble. And uh, the right hand side here will be large. So the left hand side has to be large and positive, which means that the WI plus has to become large, and that, then I get hit by that penalty in the objective function. If the D is really small, this right hand side is uh, negative, so I've got to activate this variable here, and I get hit again in this uh, term of the objective function, and these are the non-negative constraints. But the thing to notice is this is still a one-stage decision problem. The Ys do not depend on omega, which kind of causes a modeling complication because if they could, then uh, I wouldn't have uh, lost demand or inventory, but they don't depend on omega. They are just first stage decisions, so I have to introduce this equality constraint here. Next hour, you'll see some models where we actually have a real first and second stage decision set up. Any questions? I encourage you, in general, to ask as many questions as you want. Um, so yeah, okay. See you in ten minutes. Yes. In this second model, I assume I assume that the demand is uncertain. In the first model. <clears throat> yeah, uh, you could have certain different states of the world, uh, and in one state, omega one. The demand is high, and in another state, omega 2, the demand is low. And you will see in the third hour with Matthew a, a concrete problem where you will end up programming it actually in Ample, where demand is high, medium, or low. This is the third model. And so here, things are, um, okay. things are a bit different now. The Y will now depend on omega. So here is more of how you would probably naturally think of the problem where I get to uh, decide where I build the facilities, but then I get to observe like a slow economy or a stimulated economy, so the demand will be different depending on the situation. And now I change the driving patterns of my crew depending on what I get to observe. So here we have a truly two-stage uh, setup for the problem. Um, 
Again, we're maximizing profits, so whenever costs show up, we assign a negative sign, so these are the investment costs. Now that W uh, denotes a uh, model capacity that I built. So the W here is uh, how, how much of a certain product a facility J can produce, and every unit of capacity that I uh, um, Okay, well. Ah, yes, yes. Okay, so, um, yes, 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 I get to vary. Uh, so I'm not only deciding if I build or not in a certain location, but I also decide how much to build in that location of a certain factory. So if I decide to build, I incur a cost, and then every unit of a capacity I build, I, I pay a cost. And uh, now the second stage decisions are indexed by omega. So I react to what I observe. A very different problem from here where there is no index omega. Um, Again, we have this, uh, y, the y represents a fraction of how much of a facility I use, so I can't use more than 100% of each facility. And now, um, this W, which is a decision of how much of that factory uh, to build, so how many units of a product it should uh, be able to uh, produce, comes into the problem by creating an upper bound for, for this sum over here. So uh, the total amount of product that I send to customer uh, I, but it's not his whole demand, it's the fraction of his demand served by J. So summed up overall customers cannot exceed the capacity of that factory. Again, if I decide not to build a factory, all the fractions have to be zero. Okay, so these are three different flavors of something that, that looks like the same problem, but uh, depending on the timing of first and second stage decisions, we're actually looking at very different problems. Now, um, uh, this slide is meant to make a point that uh, stages of decision making just have to do with uncertainty observations. Uh, a decision is first stage if I have to decide before obs observing the first round of uncertainty. It's not first stage because it's the beginning of time. A certain stage can have many decisions. Uh, it's just saying that that stage is uh, all the things I decide to do before actually getting to see uh, the roll of the dice. So here's the two setups of the same uh, problem. Uh, we have a 36-month horizon. Uh, first stage of decisions is where will I put my warehouses? Um, and then I get to observe uncertainty about, for example, demand, and I get to react. So then I have another uh, 30 months of decisions that I'm making. If you set up th this problem as an optimization problem with monthly decision making, the first stage is not just a month, and the second stage is not just one month. The first stage is six months, and the second stage is 30 months. So one stage can have multiple time periods. Uh, a different variation of this, which is more complicated, is I decide where to locate facilities uh, today. <coughs> I also decide on my operations uh, for um, months 7 to 18, and then after one year and a half, I get another round of decision making about how to change my facility locations. Now, if there's a second round of decisions that I get to make after I've observed the first round of uncertainty, I have to create a multi-stage stochastic program. It's not just a two-stage program anymore. So here the setup is that um, where do I locate my warehouses now is what I decide from months one to six. Uh, so over here in the timeline, so the whole timeline runs from month zero to 36. Then I get to see what happened in terms of some kind of uncertainty. I make decisions in month 7 to 18 about how I distribute products in my supply chain. Plus, I have to decide in this time period of where to locate new facilities. And then I get to observe some more uncertainty. 
and then I make my last round of decisions, which is how to spread operations in the last uh, 18 months. And like I said, you can't represent this decision problem as a two-stage problem anymore, because you have this um, decision-making now, uncertainty, decision-making now, but again, depending on what I decided to do, more uncertainty. So third round of decision-making is over here. So you can see how this thing can get really rich. But the bottom line is that I have two rounds of decisions plus a third in the end of the horizon with uh, these two rounds of uncertainty, realizations. So this is really a three-stage program. Why? Because there's two rounds where someone rolls the dice and I don't know what could happen. Um, and this is how you would write it as a math program. So superscripts now are denoting stages. So this is a first stage decision of how to invest. I pay the investment cost. And now I'm taking expectations over what could happen um, over here. Uh, so I have possible realizations of what could happen in stage two. I make decisions about my distribution in round two and I pay the cost for them. But then also depending on what happened in round two, I make a change in investment. So this is here now. This X of omega 2 means I've seen this omega 2 and I'm making a second stage decision X2. And then there's this further branching here because now depending on, so this conditioning operator of depending on what happened on Xi2 means that now assuming I know I'm here, so this is a certain Xi2 uh, uh, Sorry, it's a, it's a, assuming I know I'm in this part of the tree here, I take expectations with uh, respect to what could happen in Xi3, given that I know that Xi2 went this way. So you have this nesting of uncertainty that takes place, and you make a third stage decision after you get to observe uh, this omega-3, and you're paying the cost for that decision as well. So you have these usual fractional, fractional constraints that the sum of the y's cannot be greater than or equal to 1, and this is true both for the second stage decision as well as the third stage decision. Again, um, we're using this big gamut to denote that I've invested in certain facilities so I can actually produce from it. Uh, so the sum of the total production from that facility is limited. So if I decided not to invest in that facility in the second round, I cannot produce from that facility. Well, for the third round, it's a bit more complicated because if I decided in both rounds one and two not to invest, then in the third round I can't produce. But if either in the first round or in the second round I decided to invest, that's an active facility for the third round. And I can't invest twice in a facility. I only decide to open it in the first or in the second stage. So this is a multi-stage uh, stochastic program. You will get to uh, uh, see a detailed instance in an hour from now. One last, oh, one last paragraph <coughs> from uh, chapter two of the book that I want to discuss today, and then, yes? Do we suppose there's a super uh, In this setup? Yeah. Mm, no. Then why is it there's an inequality in the constraint? Here. And it doesn't force us to serve the whole demand, and if we don't, there's no cost to not serve it. Um, what would happen if I set it to zero? I'm losing on the one hand the revenue here, well, uh, here. This Q contains the revenue of serving that guy. Yeah, so the setup here is um, you could serve the client partially. If you set up your problem like this, it's true. If you serve them partially, 
you don't pay a penalty for unserved demand, but you also lose the revenue opportunities from this term here. No, as opposed to this model here, where we we have this, yeah. It's a different, it's slightly different setup. You could, if you wanted to write it up that way, you would have to add a bunch of extra constraints. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, so, um, yeah. Uh, this is paragraph, I believe, 2.3 or 2.4. Um, so this is just a quick discussion about um, how, uh, how you model risk in a decision problem. It's actually it's, it's a really interesting problem. And um, for me, in my experience, it came up uh, like in my face when I was doing a project with uh, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric in California where they were deciding about how to play in the electricity stock market in California. Well, your objective when you're playing in the stock market, you get to play in the stock market every, every day. So you want to come up with decisions that make your average performance good. Uh, because even if one day things go bad and you lose a lot, if, you're, if you have guarantees that your average performance will be good, then you will live this, uh, the roll of the dice over and over. Every day is a different roll of the dice. So setting up a decision problem as an expected value optimization problem, it's, it's not a bad idea because you get to play the game 365 times every year. So over these 365 times, the average uh, accumulation of profits will be pretty close to what your model told you would happen. Very different from a setup where you only get to live reality once. For example, uh, what Berge Louveau mentions as a nice example is assigning seeds, uh, pricing seeds for a World Cup. You get one World Cup every four years and they're done in different countries. So when a certain country is deciding how will I set up prices for the coming, when now Brazil is deciding how to price uh, tickets for the World Cup, they're not going to have the World Cup every week going on in Brazil for the next 10 years. It's only going to happen once. So there, what they actually get paid versus what they would get paid on average could be very different because they only experience reality once. So they might want to capture a certain level of risk aversion. They might not want to make decisions that are good on average, but decisions that guarantee to them that for this one time that the World Cup will take place in Brazil, if things go bad and not as hoped for, at least we won't do real bad. So that, you know, when you only get to experience uncertainty a few times, you want to also add risk aversion to your model. Um, so you have a couple of examples here of uh, uncertainties that occur frequently. So for example, how the airlines are screwing you over to, you know, uh, assign you to economy or business class is something that the airlines do every day uh, for many years with a bunch of different airplanes. So an expected value optimization is very reasonable objective. Um, unfortunately, uh, oil spills apparently for oil companies are very frequent too. So, you know, protecting for average oil spills is a reasonable formulation. Uh, and then the facility location problem that we said here, the transportations could be happening every week. So it's a game you play repeatedly and an expected cost optimization is a good idea, as opposed to uh, you know, something that only uh, happens a few times. So how could you model uh, risk of risk? And we will see a few more details in the next lecture, but here's an example from uh, paragraph 2.4 <coughs> of how to do things um, with what we know already. So one way to uh, set up things is um, the notion of a concave utility function, which um, 
is an idea introduced by economists originally, where you express your happiness coming from payoffs through a concave function. The mapping here has a nice uh, interpretation. What it's saying is the following. Um, you give me 100 euro, and I'm this happy. But if you make me gamble, so if you walk up to me and you tell me, let's play a game. Uh, I'm going to roll the dice, uh, or flip a coin, and if it's heads, you don't get anything. But if it's tails, you get 200 euro. Well, the average of this thing is the line connecting uh, these two points on the concave curve evaluated at this point. And my level of happiness from that is not quite as high as if you had promised me, as if you guaranteed to me the 100 euro. So this, using a concave utility function, so a function that maps money you give me to the very measurable notion of happiness, is, um, is a way to represent risk in economics. Now, we could use this in our stochastic program too, it's just that this is a nonlinear curve and it's kind of a pain, so instead we would create piecewise linear approximation, and we get a stochastic linear program, uh, which uh, we can then use to represent risk aversion in our model. One approach to modeling uh, risk aversion, not the only one. By the way, uh, a line, a, sing you know, a single line here represents a risk neutral agent who is equally happy if he plays the lottery or if you give him the 100 euro already. Um, a different way to represent risk aversion um, is uh, limiting downside risk. So here, suppose that actually what we're doing is maximizing some uh, profit. So now you think of the objective function as a payoff, not a cost anymore. <coughs> and you say that I want to uh, make sure that my average downside on profit is limited by a certain level. What is a downside on profit? Is the amount of um, profit that I lose from a target level G. So my manager would be satisfied with G, but anything below G pisses him off, and anything above G he doesn't care. But if I'm going below G, he gets angry. So I want to make sure when I'm making first stage decisions, that the average amount of frustration that my manager experiences is limited by uh, a certain uh, level L. How we model that is for each outcome omega, we measure how much we fell short of the profit G. Whenever we go above, so whenever Q times omega and now Q omega is Q times Y is measuring profit now, not cost. Whenever this thing is negative, so when, whenever the profit, the second state profit is big, bigger than G, then tough luck, I don't get rewarded for it. I, it don't, this thing only counts when I'm falling short of G. And I want to make sure that the expectation of the times that I fall short of G is not above a certain level of L. This is a set of linear constraints. And you can plug this into the stochastic program. And it's another way to capture risk aversion, different from the risk averse utility function. The bottom line is that the framework is very powerful, and you can express a very rich uh, set of features by using this two stage uh, framework. Any questions? OK, so I will move to the capacity expansion planning problem. Okay. The reason I left it for last was I was not sure if we would go through. I don't want to drive you crazy by jumping from one to three to two, but I wasn't sure if we would have time to cover three, which I wanted us to cover today because Matthew is going to touch up, touch on it with his annual training section. Okay. That said, um, here is another example of stochastic programming, which might be actually the subject of the semester project. <clears throat> um, so this is paragraph 1.4, <coughs> I think, of the book. 
So what we did is we started from uh, introduction, we jumped to chapter two, we covered half of it just now, and we're returning to paragraph 1.4. And, okay. Okay, so capacity expansion planning. Uh, so what is the capacity expansion planning problem? It's actually pretty similar to uh, the facility location problem we, have, we, we saw here. And it's a standard problem that occurs in operations research. We have to decide on facilities, how much of them to build, when to build them, and we get to experience some kind of uncertainty, usually in demand. That's where things become complicated. And the application of this problem in uh, electricity is how to build power plants to make sure we meet an uncertain demand of electricity in the future. For example, if GDS Suez knew that there would be a crisis in 2008 and European demand would just stay flat or go down, in 2006, they would not have invested in all these gas plants that they are now shutting down because demand did not go as uh, high as they expected it to. Um, and this is exactly the capacity expansion problem that we're going to look at now, uh, applied to electricity. <coughs> okay, so let's first see how we would write up this problem if we were making um, decisions based on a deterministic model and then uh, and a single stage of decision making, and then we will enrich it. Okay, so we want to describe our supply side and our demand side. So we own this energy company, and we have a set of different technologies that we can invest in. Uh, we pay an investment cost RI for um, investing in a certain technology. And for every quantity of energy we produce, we pay an operating cost QI. Um, and there's this availability factor that uh, says that some percent of the time the facility might be working, but maybe 20% of the time it has to be on maintenance. And that is all we need to describe the supply side. For the demand side, uh, what an energy company really faces over the year is a time series and it kind of looks like this. This is the evening when we go home and we all turn on our uh, equipment and then this is Monday, this is Tuesday, this is Wednesday and then the weekend comes. Actually this is Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday and then the weekend things slow down and Sunday is really quiet. Well, maybe on Saturday you all go out and the clubs are playing really loud music. So, um, this is a time series. This is what it really is, but we can um, transform this data to something much simpler that we can then use to solve the capacity expansion planning problem. In particular, what we're going to do is we're going to go into Excel and call this function that asks us to sort the data in order of, uh, in decreasing order. So, look at the 8,760 hours of a year, find the one hour where we had peak demand, bring it first. In the rest of the hours, find the highest power level, bring it second. And sort your data in order of decreasing demand. So you get a curve like this, which is this same data, it's just that we've sorted it pushing the hour of highest demand first. Okay. Now this is really useful because now uh, we have a much simpler actually uh, description of demand. In fact, what this curve tells you is that you tell me a certain number of hours and I will tell you by taking the y value of this function um, that demand was that much or higher for those number of hours of the year. So if you are looking at the, at the value 10 here, I take this mapping and I tell you that demand was 10 gigawatts or higher for those 10 hours of the year. And that's information now because that's telling me, okay, um, 
for if I build 10 gigawatts of capacity, I'll be in trouble because for at least 10 hours of the year, there will, there will be more than that. So it's a very easy way to reduce the description of demand without using a time series model. So what can we do with this description of supply and demand now? We can uh, approximate the demand curve with a piecewise linear curve that says 10 hours, 10 gigawatts or higher, but let's just say 10 gigawatts for those 10 hours of the year. Then for, uh, so we split demand into these modes here, and each mode has a certain duration. The indexing is from lowest to highest mode, and um, the lowest mode corresponds to the lowest level of power demand and the longest duration. So for uh, 8,760 hours of the year, demand was 2 gigawatts or higher, which means that for no time in the year was demand lower than 2 gigawatts. So I know at the very least I need to build 2 gigawatts. So I'm going to make a smart decision. Uh, and then we have this uh, little d indexing. Uh, for d1, it's the distance of this first intersection from 0. Little d2 is d2 minus d1. Little dm is dm minus dm minus so it, uh, the little d is telling you how much extra power requirement each mode is adding to your demand. OK, um, the deterministic solution of the model is actually um, quite s straightforward. And you don't even need to solve a, an optimization problem. You can just eyeball it. Really, what determines how much capacity you need to build depends on how much time you need to serve each mode. So let's look at an example of this over here. And this is a mode. Um, so uh, let's look at what we pay for serving a certain mode. We pay the, uh, oh sorry, we look at the investment and operating cost of each plan. So let's see what investment cost we pay for a certain plant. It's R1 divided by its uh, availability factor. So if this plant is basically only available 50% of the time, the capital cost effectively becomes twice as high. But the important thing here is if I use that um, plant for zero hours, then I just pay its investment cost. But as the hours go by, I'm starting to accumulate operating costs. For a plant with a small, a higher investment cost, but a lower fuel cost, things are different. If I use it for a few hours, I'm going to pay more than I would pay with this plant. But because I, I have a lower fuel cost, I invest more in the beginning, but if I use it for many hours in the year, at some point I actually break even and end up paying less over the entire year than I would with the other plant. Here's a concrete example. Um, Gas units, very cheap to invest in, but whenever you use them, boy, do you pay money for it. Uh, that's why they are only there for emergency reasons. We invest in them as emergency backup, and then if we run into trouble in the summer, we start them up, we, we're, we're hurting a lot because it's expensive to run them, but hopefully you don't need them for more than like 10 hours a year. As opposed to nuclear plants, boy, are they expensive to construct, but once you build it, a gram of uranium can run France for three years, so this thing is more or less flat. So basically, the cost of uh, technology really depends on how many hours of the year it's running. So the optimal way to invest in it is to just take this ratio and for mode J, which lasts this long, find the best technology for that mode, which is the technology that uh, minimizes this thing here. Simple geometrical argument. You don't even need to solve the linear program for solving the deterministic single stage capacity expansion planning problem. But of course, you go to your manager and you tell him, okay, boss, I'm done. I'm going to go to um, my parents for the weekend. And he tells you things are a bit more complicated because I'm actually concerned about what will happen with our fuel costs over the next five years. And uh, there's uncertainty about uh, 
Ah, a good example of that is natural <coughs> gas prices in the United States. So, uh, a few year, at the moment, gas is having a serious problem in Europe, as it was in the U.S. until they found these reserves of uh, uh, underground uh, oil tar sands where they're doing fracking, and all of a sudden the gas prices in Euro in uh, the U.S. are ridiculously small. You might want to have that as a scenario in your capacity expansion planning problem that maybe fuel costs might, for whatever technological reason, go down in the next uh, 10 years. Another example is the evolution of demand. So no one expected before 2008 that demand worldwide would decrease after 2008. Why? Because up to that point it was going fast uh, out. There are breakthroughs in solar that can change uh, uh, the set of technologies that you have here as options. And there are uh, retirements of equipment that you haven't, for example, the retirement of nuclear units in Germany. So these things could all happen. So the problem is not just, um, what we're going to see here is actually multiple time stages, assuming we knew, even knew what's going to happen. We just want to represent the fact that we get to redecide over the years on how to change our fuel mix. So now all of a sudden the problem is not as clean as it appeared to be in the beginning. We're now looking at a horizon of periods one to capital H, and we get to um, invest a certain capacity. Okay, I think this should be a net. Um, I will get back to you on that, but no. Eh? Yeah, that should be a next problem. Sorry, uh, here, uh, you can double check me by looking at the book, but this should be a decision X, where X is how much new capacity I bring into the network. W just counts the total amount of the capacity that I've accumulated up to year T. So that means that in year T, my capacity is what I had last year, plus how much I brought in last year. But then, um, if I decided to build LI years ago, which is the lifetime of the plant, then that plant is removed after LI years. So if this is one LI, for example, 40 years ago, if I decided to invest, at time T, the plant disappears because it's retiring. So this is a, fan this is a nice way to represent retirement because of lifetime. Now, um, I invest, so then in the second stage, I get to, um, well, no, sorry, uh, I invest and then I, I run the fuel, and the fuel depends on the duration of the mode and the fuel cost of my technology. And I'm wanting to satisfy <coughs> demand for all modes. And the amount of production is limited by G, which represents the original capacity that I had available, plus how much extra I've decided to add to my network up to that point. Okay, so this is a multi-stage formulation of the model, no uncertainty up to this point. And this is a stochastic version of the model, where you not only get to change your decision over time, but now different realizations could occur. So the um, notation to uh, observe here is that I'm using bold font to indicate stuff that depends on uh, omega, so uncertain uh, uh, data or uh, uh, decisions. So for example, my investment cost could be uncertain, and again, I believe this should be an X. My fuel cost could be uh, uncertain. The decisions of how I operate my equipment could depend on uncertainty and so on. Uh, there is a, what I think is a mistake in the book, so um, Burge says that XIT is the new capacity decided in time T. And here we're, you know, when we have a multi-stage decision under uncertainty problem, we have to introduce a delay of making a decision to build 
and actually getting the plant to run. Otherwise, it wouldn't really be a problem under uncertainty because we would just wait until the last minute to see what happened. And if there were no construction delay, the problem would be kind of meaningless. But the reason I think there might be a mistake here is because um, <coughs> if XIT were the new capacity decided at T and built in T plus delta, then you should have a T minus delta here. So I think, and you can double check me on that if you have a different opinion, please explain it to me. But I think that uh, this should be uh, new capacity built in time t and decided in t minus delta i. But I might be wrong. OK, uh, so the bold indicates stuff that depends on randomness, namely on omega. And yeah, this is mostly reiterating things we already saw because we jumped directly to chapter two. The one thing that you will see come up, and if we do a project on this, you will really, really need to exploit it, is that this problem has a somewhat simple structure. Um, you can separate your decision space into things that are important and micromanagement decisions. So the problem basically has block separable recourse, where the important large-scale decisions are investment in capacity and that also determines the W, so how much capacity you have at a certain period. And then you have these detailed level decisions of how you send fuel to different demand modes, but that really doesn't matter for how you deal with uncertainty uh, of demand in the next five years. So given your investment decisions at time T, you can then make a decision of how to use up fuel, but this decision can drop off as a bunch of micromanagement tasks at this part of the decision tree. What you decide in this micromanagement level doesn't really influence the evolution in the future. So you don't have to branch each of these micromanagement decisions to uncertainty of demand in the next five years. You can just see your capacity, decide how you allocate fuel, so that's a bunch of branches here. They don't make your tree explode more. They just drop off vertically out of the decision tree. It's kind of maybe abstract at the moment, but hopefully it will become more clear moving forward. Now, uh, in the eight minutes that I'm left, here's an example of a capacity expansion planning problem pioneered by none other than Eve Smears, a member of CORE, uh, and Berge, uh, sorry, and Francois Louveau, who's in Namur. Um, so we have three technologies, uh, sorry, three modes, four technologies. It takes a year to build a plant after we've decided. This A, if you ask me, is kind of just the only reason it's in the textbook is it's because Eve used it when he wrote the paper, and it's just complicating things for no obvious reason, so you could ignore it if you want to. And we have no investment yet in our network. Now, we have three modes. Um, the first mode <clears throat> could be a bunch of things. We know it's going to last for 10 hours <coughs> or 10 time units, uh, but it could be one of three different levels. It could be, uh, oh yeah, okay, we don't have a number yet. Anyway, it could be, if I remember correctly, three, five, or seven. And then we know how much D2 is going to be. Uh, D2 is going to be three. And D1, uh, sorry, D3 is going to be two. And uh, the duration of the highest mode is one hour. The duration of the second highest mode is six hours. The duration of the third mode is 10 hours. And we can spend more than 120 units of our budget. And these are the, these are the fuel costs over here. OK. So this is the stochastic program. Um, investment costs. These were X's after, well, and yeah, it's not exactly the same, but I think I made a typo in one of the slides earlier. Anyway, investment costs. The budget constraint on investment says that they cannot exceed 120. And then I get to pay the fuel cost. So the indexing of the Y's here is 
Uh, first index is the technology, the second index is the mode, and the superscript two is the fact that it's a second stage decision. So technology one, mode J, technology two, mode J, and so on, and the reason it's bold is because it depends on the scenario. Uh, and we can have, we have, what we, we want to do here is satisfy the first mode, which is a random vector, and also satisfy the second and third mode. So, what would we do if we had, and here's an example of stochastic programming in action really mattering for how you set up an energy system in the future and really leading you to very different decisions depending on how you want to think of the future. Um, so if I write out this stochastic program according to the uncertainty I believe will happen, which is what? I give a 30% chance that demand will be low in the future, so this thing will happen. I give a 40% chance that demand will be, uh, sorry, demand will be average, so it will be 5. And I give a 30% chance that demand will be high. And I, these are weights uh, that enter in the objective function. So what will I decide to do if I don't know what's going to happen with my base load demand? Well, I'm going to, and the way we've uh, indexed here the numbers is that um, fuel, uh, it's not in any particular order. Okay, anyway, uh, so the capacity decision is this. Technology one is this much, technology two, technology three, and technology four. Now, a different way of approaching things is I could say, well, if it's 30%, 30%, and 40%, the average of that is just the middle. It's five units of demand, and I could solve a deterministic capacity expansion planning problem based on my best guess of what could happen, but that will lead to a very different decision now. In fact, um, just using the geometric argument we saw earlier, if I use my best guess, so I'm looking at three modes, I'm going to assign a single technology, to each different mode. So I'm not even going to bother investing in four technologies. In fact, I will only invest in the third, second, third, and fourth technology. So for the mode that has a demand level of three, I will invest in the second technology and so on. And this, when I solve the deterministic problem, is going to give me an objective function, uh, function value of 365 for the deterministic problem. Uh, this is kind of an illusion because that's not what's going to actually happen. Can anyone see how this... Well, actually, I'm telling it to you in the third bullet. So, um, if this... Uh, if D1 becomes 7, after all, and I've invested only 3, 5, and 2, I'm in trouble because I've invested 10 units of capacity and I got 12 after all because if D1 is 7 and you then add the 3 and the 2 that's a total of 12 and some part of the demand I cannot satisfy it. so um, this is an illusion, the 365 is not really the reality I'm going to face in the future there's a chance I might not even need load and to model that uh, to quantify the benefit of making a stochastic programming formulation, we can say that, well, you know what, if you get a level of seven units of demand, then there's this emergency backup you can bring in from uh, um, some other network, and every unit you bring in, you're going to pay a lot, an operating cost of 100. And so, in fact, if you go along with this decision and plug it in uh, and then do your best in the second stage for these three scenarios, you end up paying for 2782. Two takeaways from this slide. First of all, this decision and this decision are very different. Uh, and second, there's much value in this approach of solving a fancy stochastic program. And this is just a simple instance, but when the problem becomes bigger and the scenarios become more, you can start to actually appreciate how hedging against uncertainty is valuable. So someone could turn around to you and say, well, yeah, okay, um, I see how you are being careful about the future here, but there might be simpler ways to 
make a good decision without solving a stochastic program. Why? Because a stochastic program is a really big problem to solve. So an example of that is a chance or probability constraint. It sounds fancy, but it's quite simple, in fact. You can take your original problem. Where did the issue come up? The problem was that I ended up having this uh, high demand here, and I was not protected because I didn't have enough capacity. So you could say, well, why don't you write the original deterministic objective function and just add a constraint in there that says that with a probability of at least 99%, you will be able to meet the demand that occurs. You can do that by adding basically a constraint that looks like this. So what this constraint is saying is probability of the total capacity I have over all technologies and except for the end, which is the backstop, the emergency technology, the total capacity there exceeds the sum of all my modes. I want this probability to be really close to one. <clears throat> and keep the rest of the problem the same, but at least you know, avoid all these multiple scenarios because they cause the problem to become really large. Actually, this is a really easy constraint to model because if you use the CDF of the demand, the total demand, uh, it's just a, a single linear inequality. You take the inverse mapping of the total demand for a, a quantile alpha, 95%, uh, and you just have this single, oh, there should be a minus here, I'm sorry, I'll correct that. So you just have this single constraint that says that I want the total capacity minus demand to be greater than or equal to that quantile. So um, what is going to happen if we set alpha equal to 100%? This is another way for saying that with a probability of 100%, which means no matter what happens, I want total capacity to be bigger than demand. That's just adding a constraint that the sum of the xi has to be greater than or equal to the worst case demand for mode 1 plus the demand for the rest of the modes. So the sum of the xi has to be greater than or equal to 12. Um, and therefore, yeah, the wi is also because the g is 0. And you could write a deterministic program like that without too much, too much fancy business and scenarios and so on and solve it. And it actually gives you uh, an answer that's quite reasonable. It's not the same as the stochastic programming solution and it's just slightly worse than the stochastic programming solution. So that's an instance where you can get away with it without becoming too sophisticated and this thing can certainly happen. Um, you might end up, for some problems, writing up stochastic programs that are really difficult to solve and you didn't need to become that fancy. You could have approached the problem in a simpler way. With that, I am two minutes over time and Matthew's going to take it over with the ample exercises. Any questions? <coughs> Ten minute break. <laughs>